Charles Bronson fights in a charity bout at Bowes Theatre, East London, helping his money to help others. This bout sees Charlie unleash his pent up anger after being released from prison. Visible on Charlie's back are the words free Alan Byrne. These have been drawn onto Charlie's back so that he may bring attention to the plight of a fellow prisoner that he left behind. Cracking right hander from Charlie's close round one. Charlie gets a little too enthusiastic. Keep an eye on the crowd to the right. Just see what happens shortly. What should have been a happy crowd turns into a nasty gun. As we see what happens shortly, watch for the gun on the floor circled in yellow. What looks like a black mark on the floor is a bit more sinister than that. It is in fact a gun. As someone's foot catches it, in fact it's Charlie's foot, you can see its outline. Paul Edmonds disqualifies Charlie so as to calm the angry crowd. Joe Pyle, recording manager and film producer, served some time with Charlie. He's able to recount some of that time directly. Now, I first met Charlie in, um, in Whitemore. 
I would say about seven years ago. No, it wasn't in the unit. I was in the SIG unit in Wymore, but um, for a few weeks or a couple of months. But um, Charlie put him on the wings. And uh, quite a, a lovely guy. There was no problem with him. Dave Courtney, retired underworld figure, tells of his close encounter with Charlie when he met in the infamous Belmarsh prison. Well, I'd, I'd, um, I've never met Charlie. Um, of course, I'd heard about him, you know. And um, I was actually selling someone's Rolex when uh, when I got arrested. So I had a Rolex and I had a Rolex in my pocket. And when I got nicked and they're putting all the stuff in the property, it's got broke down. I've got two Rolex watches. Uh, anyway, one of the screws that was signed me in obviously works with Charlie. He said, we've got this right flash little bastard upstairs, you know, uh, this Dave Courtney. He's only wearing two Rolexes with all that, you know. And, um, I uh, just got up his nose a little bit. You understand? I mean, it's just, uh, there was a little bit of, um, there was a little flutter in the prison service when I was in there, and I was in the unit, and I was getting an awful lot of, uh, oh, Dave, oh, Dave, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, celebrity. Yeah. Well, no, I don't want to know. not that, but just, you know, there was a little ripple. And, um, I think the man thought that I was uh, stealing a bit of his plunder, which I could never do. Charlie's Charlie, there won't be another one, right? there hasn't been one before, and I couldn't steal his thunder if I fucking tried to. Um, but, you know, when you're locked in a, in, in a size of a wardrobe for nearly 20 years, you know, you, um, you start thinking things that may not be always right. And so he wrote me a letter internally, so he gave it to a screw and said, please give this to Dave Courtney. You know, the first letter I got from Charles Bronson, I was more on the sort of hero worship tip of the man than anything else, and I get this letter, who the fucking hell you are, you flat bastard, you're fucking uh, stay out of Luton, and I'll rock, rock. If he could have done it, he'd have sort of tore his wall down, cut myself my head off. Gotta be honest, I've gotta be honest. When I first got the letter, when I first got the letter, I was um, I was angry and upset, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm the best in the world, I'm, I can have a fucking proper tear up, you understand I mean? I can have a tear up, and it really doesn't matter what shell's like, how big the shell is. I'll fucking better most people, right? And, um, and if I had to slip to a proper good show and have a fight with Charlie Bronson, I would have done that at the time. Yeah. You know? Uh, since then, uh, since the argument has uh, dissolved and we're now writing to each other quite regularly, I have a lot of respect for the man. So that alone would stop me um, start writing letters back, you fucking bastard, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, you know? Uh, that, that would stop me doing that. Had the... Um, Oh, oh, to be quite honest, I would not like a rollabout on the floor with Charles Bronson. The chances of him rehabilitating when he comes out, I, I think, um, are very good because he's actually only he's only doing this. This is my own personal assumption. This is not a fact. This is this is what I think. Um, I think he'd rehabilitate. Well, he'd actually come out of here, come out of prison, a celebrity. He would earn money on that alone, especially at the moment. Gangster tip the media is concerned is very high profile you know they're actually making films and books and thank god for it because i'm involved in all of that and he's definitely got a very good book and definitely got a very good film in him i think i'll tell you what i think about all the books out at the moment i think maybe they might get a little bit bored of hearing about um what the gangster uh, scene was like 30 years ago Right, because all the, everyone's talking about what it was like in the 60s and all that. Well, I think they've read enough of that. Yeah. You know, not that, uh, not that the people actually writing the books now don't deserve to, because they do, but they only talk about the same things as the other bloke talks about, you know? Yeah. Uh, mine is very, very different, um, completely different. It's very humorous, and it's talking about what's happening today, and who is about today, and who got shot y yesterday, you know, not 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we cross paths in the gym. Um, and I'm very, very glad that the offer was mended before we did, because I would not like a rollabout on the floor with a man at all. Uh, have you got that, Charlie? <laughs> I like you! Lorraine, Charlie's cousin, recounts some of her fonder memories of him. Oh, little ones when he was like 
eight, nine years old, and his brother must have been like ten, same as me. And we'd go with his mum's out and we'd play, um, like, find us and everything, and like, um, go hide in there, hide in cupboards, and like, Nick used to get really excited, right, when he would find us. And also when we would sit older and we used to go out in crowds and everything, and he was the centre of attention. It was really good. It was, um, it was so funny. It was so funny. Like, Ira went away, his mum went away one weekend, went down the ball, come home, invited everyone back, and then, like, we just got this table out from the kitchen, just stood there and done the kazoo. And, like, it was all right now and everything. And he was on the table doing this. And they were laughing their heads off and everything. Always had to be the centre of attention. I can also remember when I was down, like, the bull, and um, it was a night that Tom O'Connor was playing there and everything. And I just walked past the table to go to the loo. And some bloke put his hand up my skirt, it was all mini skirts then, like, you know, that side. And um, Nick just went mad, and he went, I'm going to get him. And he just picked him up and threw him over the table. And he said, you don't touch my cousin, and that is it. Like, mad. Absolutely mad. Mm. But he was brilliant. Charlie made a recording from his prison cell for Lorraine the night before he was to appear in court. His appearance in court was in fact for the Andy Love prison siege and for the Governor Wallace prison siege. Right. It's now the 23rd of October. I mean, the block in Wordsworth. And they're taking fucking liberties with me. I'm up in court tomorrow at Luton for the trial, for the Wood Hill siege. And I should have left this prison a week ago to go to Bullingdon. Now these bastards have kept me here deliberately to mess up my head. Now they've told me they're taking me to court tomorrow, and then from court they're taking me somewhere else, but they won't tell me where. They're taking fucking liberties, Lorraine. And I can see something serious happening very soon. Because I can't take a lot more of my fucking heads in pieces. Now I'm going to court tomorrow and I ain't wearing no clothes. Fuck them. They're coming for me in the morning, the rain, and I'm not going to wear nothing. So that they ain't going to let me see ya. And the judge won't let me up in the courtroom. And I'm not wearing no clothes until the judge knows what's happening to me. How they fucking beat me up in the scrubs. And how they're disinorotating my mind. Move me all round the country. It's, it's getting too much for me, Lorraine. They're driving me mental. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but it's what they're up to. Parkhurst, long week, and um, 
Selling the business and like so we were coming down and everything, went all the way to Parkhurst, over at the Isle of Wight and everything and um, got there and we weren't allowed to see him and we said why and um, they turned around and said like because um, basically he was in a, a cell and a paddy cell and he had an injection and everything and he couldn't see us. How can they take me to court for me and expect me to go to another fucking prison? Well, don't know where I'm going. Me and you fucking police is your right. Well, don't feel happy at all. I'm upset, I feel angry, twisty, and they're doing it to me on purpose. There's no need for it. This governor told me I was only here for two weeks. I should have gone nine days ago. Nine fucking days ago, I should have gone away. So they're all liars. They're lying all the time, lying through the teeth. I hate the fucking lot of them. I can't get no canteen, no sweets, I've got no stamps, so I can't write you a letter. I've got fuck all of them. Nothing at all. If they let Maggie and Andy down to see me tomorrow, I'll give them these tapes to give to you. And I've got some drawings for you and Andy, a present from me to you two. But I'm, I'm, I'm going under, girl. I'm going under. They're, they're driving me mental. I can't see me lasting much longer. Honestly, I feel fucking bad, girl. You've got to do something about it. Get in touch with Julian and Lord Longford. Because this is fucking wrong. I should be in Belmore's. Welcome out a cup of tea. Go to the gym. Come out and be showing the day and be happy. Be treated like a human being. Not fucking slammed up like this, like an animal. I've been up 23 hours a day. I can't make a cup of tea. There's no one to talk to. I don't talk to these cunts and they don't talk to me. I'm just alone with a tr It's fucking driving me mental, eh? It's going on month after month after month. There's no need for it. It's unnecessary. How can they put me in Belmore's one minute, give me a job, I'm happy, be treated nice, then put me in these cages? It's bloody wrong, Lorraine. It can't be right. we got to get the truth out, girl. Get that book published. Get the fucking truth out. The true facts. Let the people outside see what's really happening in these places. They all think we're watching telly and having a good fucking time. Well, I ain't. I forget what a telly looks like. Yeah, they're taking liberties, liberties, you mean? And if it weren't for you and Andy, they'd fucking kill me. They'd put me in an hole. Because no one gives a bollocks about me. Even my own family. I've, 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 they're like strangers to me. They're like strangers now, Lorraine. They don't know me and I don't know them. No one understands anymore. It's just you and Andy that's keeping me going. Who understand me. Who show me a bit of respect, a bit of loyalty, a bit of love. Apart from you and Andy, I've got nothing. And you know it. Obviously I've got me mum, but it's best mum don't know about these things. Mum ain't got to know what happens to me. Or never tell me mum nothing. Anyway, thanks Andy, thanks Lorraine. I'm sorry about tomorrow, but I've got to make the stand, mate. I've got to protest somehow. I'm wearing no fucking clothes. The first one that upsets me, I'll knock them out. Because I'm fucking sick of them. Say hello, Lorraine. Say hello, Andy. I'll give these cakes to, to Izzy and Maggie tomorrow. I'm fucking... I'm disgusted, mate. Absolutely disgusted, Owen. Because it's unnecessary. How they could justify this, I'll never know. And I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Lorraine. But if it continues, I'm trying another hostage. It's the only way. I'm depressed, girl. Bloody depressed. Sick of it all. And I'll leave you one little thought. If they're gonna put me back in Wormwood Scraps, I'm gonna fucking stab one of them. I'm gonna take one of their eyes out. He hates, I mean, even now he hates any crime that's gone against women, children, um, like old people or anything. Like, the only thing he really agrees with, I suppose, is like, um, criminal to criminal. And that's it. He hates it. He just can't stand it. I mean, when he was in um, Broadmoor, um, one night he was in bed and he got up in the morning and uh, early hours of the morning and he tried to strangle his bike 
and like, I said to him, Mick, why did you do it? And he went, do you know what that bloke done? It was a black bloke. And evidently, this bloke had gone through Mick's locker and he tried to get stuff out of his locker and Mick caught him. He woke up in the night and he tried strangling the tie. I said, why did you do that? And he said, because he tied two young boys to a tree, sexually assaulted them and then killed them. He said, and he was going in my locker. He said, and that's what I can't understand. He said, that's what I hate. That's why he done it. I was in Broadmoor in the 70s. I'd only just arrived. Ronnie Craig had arrived at Broadmoor about six months before me, because I was in Brampton, and I'd left Ronnie in Parkhurst. Anyway, we are in an association Oh, <laughs> 
believe it. So anyway, I've gone, I've gone back to Ronnie Cray. I said, hey, Ron, you ain't gonna fucking believe this. He said, don't tell me. I said, what? He said, I bet you just did it. I said, how did you know that? He said, well, what it is, with you being the newest on the ward, he likes all the new people to give him a slap in the back. I said, you're having a laugh, are you? Anyway, apparently people have been knocking him out for 10 years before I got there. So, cut the dice. I wonder what they've been doing, mate, when they've been knocking them out, mate. Exactly. So, I, I, well, hey, yeah, hey, I'll tell you now, I didn't know people like that existed. Oh, yeah. Fucking lunatics. So, anyway, about a week's gone by, he's walking man. Oh, he, he lost three teeth. <laughs> I fractured his cheekbone, and he had 12 yeah. teeth in his right eye. He's in a bit of a state. Anyway, he's come up to me oh, about a week later. He says, Charlie, any chance of giving us another slapping? I said, hey, hold up. I said, you are going to give me in a lot of fucking trouble. And I don't need it, mate, yeah. I'm not hitting you no more. Go and ask someone else to hit you. I said, just drop me out. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what he said. He said, if you don't hit me, I'm going to get my solicitor up here and show him what you've done to me. And I'm going to tell my mum, my sister, I'm going to get my MP. I said, oh, hey, don't you blackmail me, sunshine. He said, well, come and hit me then. I said, get down at recess. <laughs> this time, I read that better you smashed the granny out of them. Well, what I've done this time, I went in my cell yeah. and got my PP9 battery out of my Robert's Rambler. Put it in a that sock. That's right, the old man. I put it in a sock, went down a recess, and I, I wasn't going to use it, but I showed him it. I said, right, see that? I said, do you ever blackmail me again? I said, what will happen? You'll have that right over your crust. Mm. Anyway, I fractured his skull in six places. and put me in solitary for five for four and a half years. Mm. Hey, right. How are you, mate? Charlie, as a young guy, a young boy, what are your recollections of the uh, more interesting parts of Charlie's life as a child? Well, he was a really good boy at home. We never had no trouble with him whatsoever. He was a, quite a shy boy. He was very good to myself and my husband, his dad. And he always worked, always went to work. He worked very hard, and uh, then apparently he got in with the wrong crowd, uh, people that had been inside, and uh, it just went from there. And then his father and himself had a bar in one day, and then he went to live with my mother in Ellesmere Court, and uh, he got in with the wrong crowd there, all people that had been inside. And then he um, just got into trouble, not anything serious, because it has been said that he had murdered somebody to, to, for him to be in prison. He has never, ever murdered anybody. It started off with him taking a lorry, um, a furniture removers van, with two other guys, and that's how he started. And then they, uh, th three of them went to do this garage one night. And uh, I f if, I, if I think right now, he got 28 pounds. But the police stopped him and they found a gun in the car. I believe the garage man was hit over the head. But he got seven years for that, for carrying five years and two for, for the robbery. Um, the man was struck over the head, not by my son, and it just snowballed from that, the way they trapped him inside, and um, he just retaliated against the system, because he has had some terrible things done to him since he's been in prison. He's been beaten up, they've spat in his food, he's been in a straitjacket, and they've actually... Uh, urinated over it and uh, I have been to various prisons when I've seen him beaten up 
the black eyes, um, split lips, and I went to Broadmoor once to see him, and they wouldn't let me go in to see him, and I travelled about four or five hundred miles, and we'd also booked up bed and breakfast in, in Berkshire, so we could see him, and called back the next day to see him, and they wouldn't let me in. So we sat in the waiting room for about three and a half hours, and then they let me in, and he'd been beaten up. And I went into this room where a Dr. Lucas was sitting. He never stood up to greet us or anything like that. And, um, and the words what he said to me was, who was the person that was uh, causing all the trouble at the gate? And I said, excuse me. I said, I travelled all these miles to see my son. I phoned last night to say that I was on my way. Plus, I booked him to bed and breakfast to see him, because it was a long way from Chester. And he said to me, oh, I can see who your son takes after. Uh, you, you're, you're mad. And I said to Dr. Lucas, I said, excuse me, sir. I said, but there's no one saner than me. And I've got a right to see him traveling all this way. I've got a right to see my son. And I've been turned away from a few prisons, which we've traveled all these miles, uh, because he's been beaten up. And I know what he's done inside, but he's just, uh, they'll never break him. They'll never ever break his spirit. When I go to see him now, he's always jolly and um, he really liked it in Walton. They were very, very good to him there. And I, I believe it's Hull. He got on quite well there too. But why do they keep moving him around? One day he's in one prison and the next day, or in the early hours of the morning at night, they just move him on and he doesn't know. And I don't know then for at least a week before I know that he's been moved. And I think it's all wrong the way they treat him. I know he's no angel, but they just provoke him, and uh, nobody should be trapped in prisons today like he's been trapped. And I think it's all bad. You and Charles Bronson, as, as he's now known, go back quite a long way, <clears throat> some 30 plus years. Would you perhaps like to recount um, some of your, your recollections of um, your friendship with Charlie? First met, first met Mickey hmm, 31 years ago. I was going out with my now wife, and Mickey was going out with her friend, Pauline Ashton, which is Viv's wife's sister, and Viv is, was Mickey's uncle, uh, and we had a foursome, and uh, oh, I, I, I can remember it as if it was yesterday, we'd been out, we'd had a, we'd had a couple of drinks, we're walking back home from the pub, and uh, the next thing is uh, Pauline's gone over the edge, Mickey's thrown her over the hedge, just larking around, playing, uh, that is how I first got to know him. Uh, a very, very quiet person. I know he might have thrown her over the edge, but he was a very quiet person. I mean, he was, uh, he was nice. Not, um, not the Charlie Bronson who you read about now. Um, this fellow who you read about in the paper, not. It's not Mickey, it's not Mickey Peterson. The fellow you're reading about, this madman in all the news, the most violent criminal, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the man hasn't got a violent bone in his body. I mean, um, he, wouldn't hurt, you know, he wouldn't hurt, he wouldn't hurt anybody. Uh, whether this is just my own personal opinion of him, but everybody who knows him will understand what I'm talking about. 
uh, it's not. It's not in. It does affect your picture. All your life, you live with it. Tony Lambriano spent 15 years in prison. Some of that time he spent in solitary confinement, he's able to recount in his own inimitable style some of the suffering that he too went through. I got recommended I'll serve at least 15 years. I was done 15, 9, and out of that I spent these seven years of it, one way or another on punishment. I'm in prison. I'm in one cell or another. If it's down the block or up on the location, you're still in the cell. You're not going nowhere. So, and because I suppose being young and all the rest of it, I weren't going to sit down and buckle down at the system. I didn't do it out know, if, if that had been the case, I would have come out before I even went away and worked for a living. So I didn't see why it affected my life as such. I didn't, I, th I thought, I not beef for that conviction there, but I thought it was a bit strong what happened to us. Right? So, I thought I weren't going to sit down and take it. So we've done it our way, but you've got to suffer for that. It's like, a, it's, it's like a golden rule. Now and again, you've got to go down the block to show who's running the place. That's how the system works. So if you follow what I'm saying, right, they've got to have their authority and they, you've got to have your bit of weight. So it's give and take. But if it goes wrong, then it goes, starts to go wrong badly. You, 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 you go down in places, I mean, if you're talking about solitary confinement, yes. and I spent in one week 15 months solitary confinement uh, after the Gartu riots in 72. And I went in on my Christmas present that year on the 24th of December, I'll never forget it, 72, they said, I've got some Christmas mail for you. And they gave me 40, what I thought were Christmas cards, but they were VCs, border visitors. When there's a serious offence committed in a the prison, the governor can deal with it. And yet I think now he can give you up to 28 days. At that time, he's only give you 14 days in the block. Other than that, if they want a heavier punishment, then you have to go for what they call the VC, or the border visitors. They're magistrates. You're supposed to look after your interest, and they put you in front of a kangaroo court. I mean, <laughs> and you're guilty before you even open your mouth. If you talk your way out of it in some way, then all the better. But anyway, uh, I round up, I've got the VCs, and unbeknown to me, they'd open these two control units, one in Wakefield and one at Wilmer Scrubs. And the whole idea was to control you with heavy punishment, because most of them were doing so long, it didn't matter. 20s and 30s and 25s, well, what do you do with men like that? So what they did, they, they, they opened these two control units, they put me and another man in there. And uh, the whole idea was, you don't see another inmate. You exercise in little cages on your own. There was two little cages in there, about 30 foot long, about 15 foot wide, and you walk around. Never to see another inmate in the whole pit. They stipulated no smoking for nine months, no newspapers for nine months, but basic diet for the period of time you're in there. Anyway, in the end, I mean, the, I had no bed. The bed was taken out during the day. All I had was a plastic mat. And the cell, I always remember, it, used to, was on the end of A-Wing, the control unit. And the other side of the wall is one of the scrubs. And like, during the summer, now I could hear the kids and all that. But you had a dome, like a plastic dome, outside the window, so nothing could be loaded or passed into you. And the whole regime was based on that, on complete control. Brutalise it without being brutal. That's another way of putting it. It's a mental thing. Right? And obviously, you, you start to adapt to it. It amazes me, uh, your mind can, can adapt to that situation. And uh, after about a couple of weeks, because like, I, I told them straight, I said, look, if this is the situation you're, you're going to go, then I always remember the governor coming round on the Christmas morning, 72, and he said to me, I don't agree with this. He didn't agree with what was going on in his units. He didn't agree with the regime they were going to put up. And uh, he, he, I said, well, if you're a Christian, which you're telling me to be on one hand, this ain't practicing Christianity, you, if you want to go religious on it. But I'm not, that ain't the point. Practice what you preach. But I'll tell you something now. While I'm here, you're going to have to live with me. And I'm going to throw my pot out of there every day. You're going to have to clean the mess up. I ain't doing nothing, nothing to lose. If, if, if they think in some way that you'll, you'll buckle down and get on with it, then they'll, they'll withdraw. But when you're talking about someone like Charlie, 
they're always aware of him. So when they, every time they open that door, he's up against it. You, you hear these stories about what they say, well, put this felon in a, in a, in a cell and throw the key away. And I think, I, I think myself personally, this is what they want to do with him. He's an embarrassment to the prison system. And if actual things come out about the way they treat him, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I went to visit him in Wakefield Prison. Now, I got there. Now, I, I cannot say nothing about the, the prison officers and the prison staff in there. They, they were fantastic. A, a Governor Parry, uh, especially, a real nice, a gentleman. And he takes me in to this place, and it was a, it was a, it was a door in a great big room. It was a door with wire mesh on it. And he tells me to go and sit by this door. So I sit by this door and I thought I'm, I'm waiting like for somebody to, to open this door so that I can go and see my, go and see my friend. And no doors, no, no doors are opening. And on the other side of this wire mesh is Mickey. And I says to him, I said, uh, I couldn't believe it that, what you, what you going to do to me? He's not, he's not going to do nothing to me. What, 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 what's all this, um, all these precautions? Well, you know, this is a friend of mine. He's not going to hurt me. Um, and I says to him, I said, um, I said, Mick, I said, uh, it's a bit like Chester Zoo, this. I said, uh, actually, the animals have got a bit more freedom. I said, that's like a wire mesh door. There's a little, there's a little tiny gap at the bottom of the door. I said, I, 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 I said what's that for? He said, oh, he said, well, they feed me through that. There's men I've known who, who spent 10, 12 years off and on down, down Pullman. But you can see it. You can see it. They've gone down, you, you've gone down that road and there's no turning back now. And you, you'll just lash out every time. There's, there, there comes a time, which I'm surprised as happened in, in this case, where they've gone, look, they ain't going to win here, but they ain't going to let him win. So let's, let's go down a middle road here somewhere. But it just seems to me like that, that he, he's up against it 24 hours a day, year in, year out. I'm surprised that that he's handled it in, in the way that he has. That he, he, he can still sit down and write a letter and have a visit in that. But I would think that it's... Well, I just don't know how he's handled it. I find it incredible. I, I don't know anyone who has done that long in these conditions. I mean, well, I'll credit to him. If he, if he, if he, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen for many, many years. And, but, but, he seems to be handling it all right. I suppose he's so used to it now. I mean, what, what's the point of it now? It, it, they can't do it physically now. It's, that's gone. That side of it is gone. So it's a mental thing now. And, and, and when you're running them, down them lines, I mean, who's brutalising who now? Let's get it right. Crime Through Time Museum at Newent is a, is a fairly outspoken, um, sometimes controversial museum, and we deal with the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Some people look upon the ugly in, in, in different ways to what I may look at, upon them myself, and uh, certain characters I, I, I believe are legends, and uh, I have no qualms in actually putting them out on show to members of the public, and I find myself uh, that the people that come into the museum are very intrigued with these characters and there's people in, in the museum like Charles Bronson, Bonnie Cray, Reggie Cray, Dave Courtney, they're all featured and um, I believe I give them some respect. Um, a lot of people fear them and um, 
crime through time just gives a very interesting insight into the into the, the criminal underworld. A lot of these people uh, tend to be in the spotlight. Uh, I think that the tabloid sensationalism that, that surrounds a lot of these people, um, a, lo a lot of it, I believe, glamorise them and uh, glorify a lot of what they've done. Uh, again, I think I'm a little bit different. I, I put a, a balanced side of the story across, and there's, there's certain things I can see in some of these individuals. Uh, for example, their, their artwork, their, their letter writing, uh, I believe they they are, in, in many ways, they have a hidden talents, which um, I believe I expose to a certain degree. Um, and and again, I, some people look upon me as being some sort of sick, macabre collector of criminal underworld, um, memorabilia, um, etc., etc. Uh, I believe that I'm I'm providing a museum to the public which they want to see. The Black Museum of Scotland Yard is the only museum that I'm aware of throughout the world that's open to members of the public that deal with real life crime. I deal with real life crime at the same time. It's present day crime, present day activities and also what they're up to in, in prisons at the moment, how they keep themselves busy, um, their communication with the outside world. Um, and to some degree, I provide a platform to enable them, them to communicate with the outside world. Um, no, I don't think I do glamorise cr crime. Uh, there's pieces in the museum that uh, cover Hitler, Himmler, the Holocaust, um, and many, many other sectors of, of real life crime. Uh, people aren't really necessarily shocked by what's in the museum. I think. If they're honest with themselves, they're just shocked at the events. And uh, again, I, I'm not not worried in, in exposing some of these uh, areas for the benefit of the members of the public. So what some people then find it offensive that you've got these modern day outlaws, criminals, prisoners who are still alive and have survived their past, find it very offensive that you put them up on show in some way, might be accused of making money out of crime. Um, that's, that's their personal view. Uh, again, I, I'm one of these people that um, is fairly outspoken. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared to, to sort of discuss with people um, subjects that involve them criticising the people that I put on display. It's my personal choice who I put on display. Um, those people from prisons that contact me uh, with a view of participating, if you like, in, in the museum, uh, I'm, I'm very honoured. And uh, the likes of the Cray twins, uh, Charles Bronson, um, you know, they're real people. I give them respect. Uh, and I'm not worried at, at all at, as to the effect that may have. Uh, with, with other people. If they don't want to come into the museum, then don't come in. Um, there's, there's signs on, on, on the entrance saying, warning, if, if easily offended, then we suggest you do not come into the Crime Food Time Museum. And that is my stance. Uh, the, the brochure, which is distributed to all the tourism agencies, give a clear indication as, as to what's in, in the brochure. And um, you know, that, that's, that's my position. We are the Black Museum of Gloucestershire. We will always, w we always will be, and uh, we will become a, an institution, I think, for, for the good, the bad, the ugly. The artwork that I have on display, in particular, you mentioned the name Charles Bronson. Um, I think he's a very highly intellectual man. Um, and I, I feel very, very sad at the way he's been treated in, in prison today. I don't think he's, he's had the respect. I think people have paid too much attention to fear in the man. Um, again, with his artwork and his, his letter writing, which has been sent to the museum, um, you know, many, many people comment uh, as to the quality of his artwork, the skill involved. He may be an aggressive person by nature, but he's also, you, you can see a, a gentle side to, to Charles Bronson. And I, I think you just need to understand the man as opposed to just, you know, locking him up in solitary confinement and 
uh, for 22 years, I think, is is absolutely pathetic. The system has failed. Um, Charles Bronson needs some assistance in in understanding him and uh, those that have failed him today, which I think they have. Um, there should be a, a critical report issued against these authorities for having failed in their duties. Uh, it is not right to cage a man like an animal. He is not an animal. Some of his drawings, I think, are very, very sad, um, and they portray a man that's, you know, is, is suffering. I don't condone what they do in terms of the crimes they, they've committed. Um, they've paid the penalties, um, but I, I think, particularly with Charles Bronson, he's been there since '73 for an attempted armed robbery. Uh, he's now 26 year, years later. He's, he's no further forward. He's, he's been involved in siege after siege after siege, and uh, you know wh where's it got the system? Where, where's it got him? Um, if anything, it's made him a very, very talented artist, and uh, I think he w will have world recognition for his artwork. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, very honoured, honoured, and proud to actually put him on display, and he will be a permanent exhibition within the museum. Um, Oh, Dave Courtney, by the way. Uh, Dave, uh, we actually met some time ago, uh, and uh, I think you called me a bald-headed bastard. But uh, I've got a little bit more hair than you, David, and uh, I may not be in the front magazine at the moment, front cover, but I think I will be soon. I've got a little bit more on the top. Uh, mine's lost because of the headboard. I don't know how you lost yours, David. Anyway, best of luck to you, mate. What it is, what, what, what it is with Mickey, he, he hates, he hates anybody, he hates bullies, paedophiles, can't, he can't, he cannot stand them, I mean, uh, anything to do with, with children, old people, anybody, any, anybody will hit an old person, um, Women, oh, he'd never, he'd never ever lay his finger on a woman. Oh, I mean, that that is just completely not in his, not in his vocabulary. Um, I yeah. mean, the, the man is the man is he's he's full of emotion. I mean, I I I had a I had a bad do with with me daughter. I mean, and it it felt to me like as if. As if he was there. I mean, he he got to hear about it, and I mean, and the support I got off him. And I I did go through a bad time five or six years ago. My me, me daughter got raped, and uh, how he got to know about it, I don't know. But I, I got a letter off him, and I got phone calls off him, and you know, the it's like as if he was hurt. As much as I was, and I couldn't do nothing about it, and he couldn't do nothing about it. But this is um, the sort of person, what he is. Uh, people say, you know, something happens, an old lady gets mugged or a child gets assaulted. Um, what what do people say? Oh put me in the cell with him for half an hour or let the parents and we we would all wish to do these sort of things it let let me have half an hour with that bloody scumbag let let me have him and half the problems with with Mickey when he's been in prison is is he he, he does what we what we want to what we want to do and you don't re you don't read about this in the papers and they don't tell you about this on the television and where, where He's in for all these things and what he's done, and this this madman has just got seven years for taking people hostage in prison. I mean, who did he take hostage in prison? Some hijackers. They went and hijacked a plane load of innocent people. They got five years, I think. They got five years. He got he got seven years for. For doing to them what we any any normal person would want to do, and what he should have really done then 
uh, at that stage. He should have been tried, I think. He should have elected to go for trial by a jury, because I don't think there's a jury in this country would have found him guilty. And what he did is uh, he, he plea bargained to this. They promised him, they, they literally did. He told me this himself. They promised him that he would get a suspended sentence on, you know, to run concurrently with what we with what he's already with what he was already serving. And they, he told me this himself. He said they Ray said they promised me that if I just hold my hands up to doing this, it'll be it'll be wiped, you know, you'll it'll be running with what you've got to do. And what, what, what did they go and do with him? They shot him down and they give him seven years. Charlie took prison librarian Andy Love hostage because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and at the end of that Charlie shook Andy's hand and wished him all the best. I want to see the best outcome possible which is you two coming out safely. That's what I want to see. That is what I want to see. Mm. Andy. Well Andy wants to come out, yeah I know. I want Andy to walk out that door and have a lot of to Do you want a comb for your doll's hair? Do they have real hair? I, don't. I didn't realise that. I just thought it was like a plastic thing. It's the ideal relationship, isn't it? Hey? Ideal relationship. No. But sometimes life isn't like that, Charlie. Well, what you've got to remember, sir, is this. Life is pleasant and natural. Right. You're locking people up who don't want to be locked up, obviously. So what do you do for people who commit a crime then? I'm not saying don't, don't, No, I'm asking you, because, I mean, you know more about it than me. You're more experienced folks. Yeah. You've got to have prisons. Yeah. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is it's an unnatural way of life. True. Get a budget and put it in the cage. Yeah. If it's born into the cage, it's not right. Right, I get you. No man wants to be locked up in prison. Obviously, he's in there because of his own doings. He has right. to be locked up. Mm. You know, to pay his punishment or get to the side or whatever he's done. Right. What I'm trying to say is he's on an unnatural way of living. What's a joke then? What's a joke then? No, I think that's every joke we offer you. Yeah. Well, that's right. I think you're in it together, myself. I think you're in it together, myself. <laughs> that's right. I should have bought some clean shirts with me, really, shouldn't I? I should have bought some clean shirts with me for the weight. <laughs> I might get into a tracksuit later. We're going to play the funeral march instead of the wedding march, eh? Yeah? <laughs> right, my doll's going to be called the Black Widow. The Black Widow? Is that a name? What about a pet name, though? It's not All right. You don't trust me that much, then? I'm not going to call her on the day, then, Charlie, if I don't know her name. Just Black Widow. Hey? Why? Because she's going to be dangerous. Charlie, what do I call her on the day if I don't know her name? I'll tell you on the day. Right, oh right, it's all right. Between us. Between you and... Hey, smashing. Gold. How do you know it fits though? How do you know it'll fit? So you have to take the girl down to the shop and get a measure and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Smashing. Engagement ring? Just for them wedding ring, yeah. It's right, I'm sure that. No one's going to stop me going through that door. That's right. I've got my own cousin. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't have to get that far, does it? No. Just say the word and we'll open the door, we'll bring you both out, and that'll be the end of it. And I'll come.
come down and talk to you every day? You might be fickle and cast me aside. No, oh, I do. I realise that. Yeah. It's got to be the doll. There's nothing that you can think of that might change your mind. And I shall return. But. Uh, don't let me down, all right? You, you keep and sit tight and... I'll see you later, Andy, all right? I'm going to uh, pass you over to my friend Tony. He's a nice bloke. You like Tony. See you later. How are you doing? You all right? Well, when they pull the fingers out, things will be better. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know what the system's like, mate. This man here ain't had a cup of tea for five hours. Uh, so, I've, uh, I mean, I've only just got here, so... Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that how long has been going on? I think five hours. Longer than that. You both all right? No, he's as good as gold. You all right, Andy? Yeah? Lovely. What's it all about, mate? Well, where are you off? You going to I'm off CRC, you, see you it? yeah. I work with um, Sarah. Well, it's a long story, mate. Yeah? Oh, no, I mean, just tell the details, mate, the brief details. A long, a long story. Yeah. I'm sick of solitary confinement. Yeah, well, you spent a long time in it, haven't you? How long have you spent in it now? It's a long time, mate. No one can beat that, can he? I've beat no one, no one can. I've beaten this block five months. Yeah. No problem. Screws are tracking decent. Yeah, they're not bad, agree. I've tracked them decent. Yeah. They've stopped my visit password. Now, the problem is, I'm probably facing another 20 years of my life in prison. If I get yeah. I'm not prepared to spend another 20 fucking years in the block of land. Well, that's understandable. So my demand is a blow up doll. I will let him go. I want a doll. Blow up doll. Blow up doll. That's all I want. <laughs> that's all I want. Is that going to be much company for you, that man? Well, it's the only company I'm going to get rid Because I'm not allowed no. to mix with other companies. So I want a fat doll. Well, I mean, you've been on the units before, though, haven't you? You've been on the units before. I mean, it, I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot about your case. I mean, is there much chance you've been found guilty? I mean, you, you'd know more than me. 50-50. Is it? So, I mean, well, you, you, I bet you've been in worse situations than that, then, haven't you? I've been in worse, yeah. So, I mean, so 50-50 ain't that bad. I'm fucking sick of spending my life in blocks. Sick and tired of it. Not allowed to mix, not allowed to associate. Yeah. I want to start associating. He can walk out of that cell now. I've already given my demands, but they're not coming across. Well, it's a system, you know. It's, well, you, I mean, you've been in the system a lot longer than I have, Charlie, haven't you? That's the problem. And it takes that bloody long to get the smallest thing. They don't give a fuck about it. Well, no, we, I mean... Basically, because they've not given you a capital. We all give a fuck about both of you. No, no one gives a fuck about me. Because I've been down here five months, no one's lifting a finger. But I'm talking about this man here, isn't this? Yeah. yeah. Mama, I just can't see you from this hole, but I can feel you in my soul. Mama, what cripple wouldn't crawl one mile uphill to only see you smile? Tell you what, don't tell me why Tell you can look me in the eye
Charlie breaks the tiny cell door window. He breaks it so that he can pass Fred Lowe a cup of tea, because during the time of the siege, he's been there for some 40 plus hours, and none of these prisoners have been fed. Family friend, yes. Is that right? 
Jack Jack there, and we don't really Jack's a lot, but he did, he's, he's been catch his between us, hasn't he? So, I relate. Lord Longford has been visiting prisoners for the last 50 years. Although people consider him to be a champion of lost causes, he seems to have struck a winner here with Charlie. I think it must have been his cousin, a very charming lady who asked me to go and see him, but I did admit I went to visit him. When I got there, the staff said to me, uh, you know this gentleman is rather violent. That's what they call him a gentleman. I don't know anyway, this man is rather violent. And, uh, you may want to have someone in the room with you. I said, no, I'd rather just touch it and told it's bother now. And um, so I went in and said to him, I'd never met him before, of course, I'd never said to him, uh, uh, what have you been doing this today? And he said, I've just done 2,000 press-ups. And now I believe he does 3,000, but it was 2,000 then, some years ago. So I said, well, I'm uh, in my late 80s, but uh, you know, I used to do a dozen a day and have a shot. So I did one. You know, London suit and so on. So that rather the worst for wear. But anyway, he was very amused, and we became friends from that time onwards. That's where it all started, really. So I've visited him in various places since. 
Right, that, that, that's wonderful. And I do believe that you um, then consequently went to, uh, made a visit to court in which uh, Charlie had been. Yes, I did go. I don't remember that too clearly, but I certainly went and so on. I had these various visits, of course, and they said, on one occasion, I went and they said, uh, uh, we're rather sort of start today. If ordinarily, if we have somebody waiting outside, uh, but um, if we lock the door, uh, we would. We don't need to keep anybody outside. So uh, I had with me a, a lady assistant. So I said, well, I don't know. I answered for myself, but I think this lady might be in danger. So we, we then said, well, I mean, thirteen officers being outside. So thirteen officers waited outside. The door opened, and ready to rush to our assistant. I've never had the slightest such threat or danger from Charlie, and he always been very friendly. But for some reason, I offended him a little while ago. I don't know how. I can't imagine why, but he came. He does take offence, and uh, uh, I was very glad to hear that from him. A letter the other day, a nice warm letter, saying he'd be happy for me to pick up for him in this program. But I'm very fond of him. Very fond. Of course, you've done prolific work uh, within. Um, the realms of visiting prisoners in the last, yeah. um, as you've said, 60 years. Well, I began 60 years ago, a bit of a break then with the war, but then read, uh, uh, for the last uh, 40 years, certainly uh, uh, with a, in a break when I was in the cabinet but for three years, but otherwise I've visited prisoners well every week or even two a week. I've been to two this week, for instance. And you visit them every week, obviously, um, it, it's an enormous amount of um, output for you to do, particularly at your age now, you travel constantly. Um, well, it's unusual, but then other people do other things, I don't want to, if they get a mistake to boast, the other day, after visiting a prison, I was coming away and a lady in the, in the carriage said to me, I've known you a lot longer, uh, how many great-grandchildren have you got? I said, 14, I think, and I, I made up, no, I got 16, but 14. And I then added a little complacently. That's rather more than most people, I fancy. And the man opposite, though, that's nothing. I got 17. Because he might have been lying, and he just wanted to put me in my place. But anyway, he told me not to boast. I offered that bit of advice, but it no, wasn't needed. Yes, and you think and, and feel within yourself that you will continue doing this output of work, visiting prisoners and working on their behalf. Oh, yes, I'm sure I will. I mean, uh, after I have a stick now, I'm, I had a fall last year, so I need a stick, so I made a little poem. I've become a man with a stick. I've become exceedingly slick. It's part of my life, and except for my wife, the one thing that makes me tick. But as I have a stick now, I go round to prisons, and uh, yes, I wish I'd do that. Well, I imagine, well, as long as I'm compost mentis. What do you think about... Um Charlie Bronson's artwork and his... Well, it's very successful, and I mean, I think it's wonderful that he's done this, this, this cartoons, but I'm not a judge of that sort of thing. I'm interested in the Castle Awards. I've been every year, I've seen his awards, but uh, I'm not a judge. I just, anyway, I think it's marvellous. He's got a great gift for it. A very splendid gift. It's a great release for him. Do you think that over the time, whilst uh, perhaps... Uh, someone's incarcerated, that they need to keep, keep themselves occupied in a, in a, a way such as Charlie Bronson. Yes, they do, but I think he's got that. I mean, you couldn't just invent that talent. He's got, got it there. I mean, this gift for cartoons, I don't know where it came from, but he is, uh, he's, he's very good. And of course, he's a bit of a, a poet. And, and uh, the cartoons, yeah, that's just where he's excelled. He's won the prize every year, isn't he, at the Castle Awards. No, I think very remarkable. But they said, he's a charming man, I say, with him, and yet he would go and get away from it. He's very dangerous to many people. He's taken a lot of people hostage and so on, and, uh, and so on. And therefore, he's, he's, I won't use any. And then you can find a word to describe him, really, because uh, it's not like other people, but he's very strange. Do you feel safe in his company when you visit him? The answer is, I've always felt safe in his company, but if someone locked the door, uh, I wouldn't feel quite so safe, I suppose, but the door is always open, not open exactly, but it's, 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 I, can, I can escape. Uh, no, I do feel safe. I've never felt threatened by him at all. 
joy been affectionate. And I mean, even though I believe on the last occasion, I've never offended him, but he didn't show it. What do you think, perhaps, um, the outcome of the, the situation is? Do you think Charlie Bronson will ever be uh, released? Well, I, I, I can't imagine what will happen. I mean, um, if you go on and taking people hostage like that, you obviously are dangerous. And uh, so, in a way, I mean, if he's, um, no, I, I he certainly he won't be released. I'm sure in my lifetime, I'm 93. Uh, I don't expect to see him released in my lifetime. But and if he were released, I think he would have to be very closely supervised. And I a bit, but um, and I suppose he wants to be released. I haven't asked him lately. The Swellbellies, a hardcore punk rock band from Scotland. They've composed their own tribute to Charlie, and in the grounds of Crime Through Time Museum, they perform their song, Caged. writer from the USA compares his artistic feelings to what Charlie's going through. 
I've been writing for about 10 years screenwriting. Uh, before that, I, was, uh, I worked as a news reporter, and also um, I wrote a few short stories. But I prefer, to me, the visual is the most interesting form of um, creativity right now, because as they say, peak, uh, picture speaks a thousand words. I think you can get your message out through visuals much more than um, novels or anything like that. And really, who reads anyways anymore, it seems like. But um, we've written Viv Graham's story, which is in uh, development right now. Um, we're soon to, that will be coming to a theater near you eventually. And um, a story about uh, Newcastle, Viv Graham, the hard man, and um, gangster thriller and set in Newcastle. Right now we're in the very early stages of the Charlie Bronson um, film, which uh, as of this point I haven't quite decided the way to go. I think it's very important we decide which angle we're going to portray this from um, since he's pretty much going to be spending the rest of his life in jail as far as I know. Um, therefore it could be very it's going to have to be more, I like to make things more optimistic and upbeat, but it's going to be a very much challenge to find a story about a person who's been spending more than half his life in jail and looks to spend the rest of his life in jail. To find that to be uplifting will be quite a challenge to me, but I think there will be a way that I'll be able to do it. Um, it I mean, depending, in, in the case of Charlie Bronson, where he's a, he's a poet really now, um, reading some of the work he's done. I've just read his book. Um, it's, there's quite a lot of similarities between somebody who's a writer of any kind, whether it be poetry, fiction, or uh, screenwriting, which is what I'm doing. Um, basically, you have to be able to empathize. Um, whatever the subject is, you have to really put yourself into the shoes of the person that you're going to do the, the story about, um, whether he be real or he be a made-up character, you still put a lot of yourself into it. I think it's the searching of your own self, the exposing of your own self that gives you the juices that will be the creativity that makes you able to write. Every artist, whether it be music and, and writing and, and, like I said, whatever you're writing, I think you definitely have to visualize and you have to put yourself into it. I think in this case he's been locked away in isolation for so long that it's given him it's one of those events where it happens to everybody. When something bad happens to you and it's a crisis and you think the worst of it, but then you look down the road and you find out that really the bad thing that happened ended up giving you a good thing out of it or it made you be more creative or you become, if someone makes fun of you when you're a child, you end up becoming very witty. And I think in Charles Bronson's case, being locked up in solitary confinement, although on the outside it looks like it would be a horrible thing, I think it's gotten his creative juices flowing it's, it's gotten him to become, search his inner self and his inner soul to come up with the creativity and the poetry and, and he's tapped into the resources that most people have those resources. It's the secret is tapping into them. But it is a form of release. It is for me. I know it must be for Charlie and it has been for an awful lot. I've, I've been very lucky in meeting and getting to know these people uh, very, very close quarters with myths you know, with uh, the Frankie Frasers, the Freddie Formers, Roy Shores, Tony Lambrianos, you know, um, Charlie Richardson. I actually know these people, and it's been very, um, a very good learning period for me w with these people. You know, you learn from your peers, and I, I've been taught my profession by the very, very best. And hopefully I can carry on in, um, now I've retired, uh, in speaking about my profession, uh, as successfully as I did in doing it. You know? And I did very successful, thank you very much. But the media would um, find him most entertaining. You know, he's a very, very funny, very witty, very charming when one when wants to be, um, very talented fella. You know, his artwork is, he, he could actually be an artist, you know, although his poems are a little bit um, off key sometimes, they are actually good poems and, and he just he can just reel them off and he can just you know draw paint write books you know he's a very talented man and I'm sure that if exploited in the right way he would um, excel in something with the media well I think
it's fantastic the way Charlie's keeping fit in, in prison. Unbelievable. Um, it, it's it's hard enough to keep your, your sanity when you're in jail, never mind keeping your fitness, and what Charlie's doing is fantastic. But basically, I heard that Charlie was a fighter before he went into prison, and from one fighter to another, I decided to drop my line and just see how he was getting on in jail. Um, Charlie was pleased, he was uh, really happy, Do, doing me a drone. Uh, there was a picture of me and Charlie standing behind him, uh, hand on my shoulder, saying, born to fight, maximum respect, Charles Bronson. You've, you've got to be an intelligent to, to, to keep your body in trim. Uh, and what Charlie's been through, the length of time he's been in jail, and the length of time he's been in solitary confinement, um, you know, the wonder people think he's insane, but the man is not, because he's very intelligent in what he's doing in his life, uh, and what life he has, he's making the most of it. Charlie is a, he is a warrior, he's a, he's definitely a born fighter because he's, he's succeeded to, to stay fit and to stay alive while he's been in jail. So from one fighter to another, not just uh, a fighter in the ring, but a physical fighter, uh, I was really pleased. I was honoured to get a, a drone from Charlie and a letter back. Well, solitary fitness, like I said, the guy's been in, in prison for a long, long time. Uh, guys have got uh, state-of-the-art uh, workout gyms on the outside of prison. Uh, and they're still not keeping in good fitness and control of what Charlie is. I mean, for a guy to be locked up in a little cell 23 hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day, and stay in the fitness that he is, his, his methods are, are definitely working. Uh, about my valley too, though, um, basically I fight all around the world in an all rules barred style of fighting, which is anything goes. Um, I'm British champion, intercontinental champion, after just beating the world, world champ. Uh, I've been the first ever Briton in 15 years. Uh, to fight in the octagon, which is a cage in, in America. I've just come back from fighting now. I was asked to, to do the fight scenes in, in the film, the Charles Bronson film, um, and I like to put my expertise uh, in, into that work, because uh, obviously there will be some, some fighting scenes in the film, and I'd like to, to do that the best I can. Um, I've made my way through the British ranks, beating everyone in Britain um, with relative ease. So obviously we've got to start up and put a new contender for me uh, outside of uh, Great Britain. So a promoter from down London called Andy Jardine came up with uh, Travis Fulton, who was currently the world champ at the time. Uh, I took it with a pinch of salt until it actually came off, uh, which I fought him down Hemel Hempstead. Um, and I won by TKO, because I had punched him and the guy submitted from punches uh, in the, the second round in nine minutes. Uh, Eight months ago as an amateur, then moving through the professional ranks within two months, uh, beating the best in Britain uh, within the next couple of months, and then beating the world champ, and then being the first ever guy to fight in the cage in America, all this has taken nine months in total. The worst feeling I've ever experienced in my life. Travelling 6,000 miles on my own, even though there's people all around you, you, you feel like a prisoner. You feel trapped among the four walls of your, of your hotel room, didn't want to go outside, no one could understand my accent. Um, didn't have friends, didn't have family there. It was, it was horrible, horrible feeling. Only to think what Charlie's going through, it must be devastating. The way he was locked up and the way he is in solitary confinement, I just, I just couldn't bear the thought. It must be terrible for him. My future is to become world champion. Hopefully. After that, what will you uh, perhaps see on the uh, written on the wall? What sort of life? Well, well, I'd like to go into acting. I believe I could do that. Um, do a little bit of celebrity work, hopefully. Um, but I still want to be involved with the public, that's my main thing. In, in which way? Um, I'm hoping to open an academy, um, an academy for martial arts, every type of martial art. Yeah, have the public come along and learn the skills that I, I've been taught. Yeah. When Charlie gets out, obviously, you, I mean, there's a lot of people, you, you, I mean, I've actually had people come to me who's got, um, I don't want to say, behavioural problems. Uh, they, they can't go out and open because they've just got this bad temper, they don't know how to control it. So people come to me and they learn martial arts, which learns in discipline, and they learn how to control it. You know, it, it, it's the aggression was built up inside. If they, if they know how to bring it out in a sport, uh, and most parents come to me and say, oh, thank you, because my child has now behaved himself and, you know, he's, he's not distraught anymore. Um, and hopefully we'll try and channel that into Charlie when he gets out. Charlie's a human being like everyone else. I think he just needs to be understood. He doesn't need to be locked up like, a, like an animal. He just needs to be understood and needs to be helped. And I think once he's given that help, he can prove to everyone that he can't be allowed in society.
What is it then about men, particularly yourself, Roy Shaw, Charlie Bronson, Lane McLean, these people who are rather in the public eye because of um, the physical capabilities, what is it about these men that um, perhaps you think that people admire what you see in these men? Everyone is born, every man is born uh, uh, and they want to be this warrior. I mean, it goes back to medieval times and the gladiator times, you know, the, uh, the Japanese now, they still worship the warrior. Uh, I'm due to go in J to Japan and I can't wait because I'll be trapped like a king over there. Um, so it's, it's basically this look as the warrior, what everyone wants to be at. Every small child, and most men that grew up don't become this warrior, they look for the idol who is the warrior and basically that's, that's why they, they get trapped so well when they get looked up upon. So are you saying that Charlie shouldn't lose some of the things, the, the um, inner qualities and, and the other qualities that he has? Yeah. I think Charlie's got better inner qualities than most men outside here today. You know, for him to go through what he's been through and still... To be, to be where I am here is obviously because one, I'm a fighter, two, I'm a survivor, and three, I like to think I'm intelligent. And Charlie has them three qualities. James Crosby, retired bank robber, served some considerable length of time in some of the toughest jails in Scotland and England. Now a successful playwright and nine times Coastal Award winner, he is able to explain what could happen with Charlie. I mean, it must be a, a, a terrible thought that he could be in there for another 20 years. And well, it's all added up, he's not really done anything that terribly serious. There's murderers and child molesters and rapists, seven, five, eight years, ten years. Terrible thing, they got put in a sex register now, but they're like keeping him in prison. They should, as I said once before, do a deal with him, give him a date. A day that he can see is attainable, you know, without him cracking up too much. Say, he told him, right, seven or five years, and we'll put you in a pre release scheme. And if you continue to sort of behave yourself and don't cause any trouble, you'll get out. Now, he's done that long now. Two things happen to you when you're in the prison for a long time. One is you, be, you, you begin to accept it as, as the place you live, and that becomes your home. And that's a bad thing to fall into. The other thing is you can say to yourself, well, I'm going to aim at getting out and work towards that end. And he's doing that because he's these crack-ups now and again when he's taking hostages. I mean, he must know himself now. That's pointless and aimless. And he does it in a, I suppose, in a sudden fit. And then I don't doubt for one minute that when he sits back in his cell privately, he regrets what he's done. John Alf Lodge was one of the most feared post office robbers in Wales. Having raided some 52 post offices in all, and as a consequence of that, he served 20 plus years in prison. Now free and under the auspices of a psychiatrist for stress, he's able to recount some of the time that he spent with Charlie. Now receiving psychiatric treatment for stress, he suffered a, as a consequence of serving more than 20 years. He talks about his hard times with Charlie. One day, I think the television was on the blink, it was. I, I switched it on and, and it rolled and I, I tutted, I did. And he said, uh, what's the matter? So, come on off, he said, let's go down the office. Down the office we went, <laughs> and he, he said, uh, <coughs> he said, well, if we don't get a decent television, when, when I come out of the cell now, he said, you can all look out. <laughs> he said, uh, otherwise it's all over, like, oh. So I didn't know him too well in, then, and uh, I thought to myself, uh, over dinner, I smoked a spliff, I did, to be honest, calmed myself down a bit. I thought, oh, no, they ain't going to have this. They're not going to have this man doing this, bringing the TV here, uh, you know. 
because I was on the blink like. He smashed it, he did. And uh, when I come out after dinner, <laughs> I waited for Charlie to go first. I thought, oh, I'm going to have a look what's in there, in the TV room. He walked into the TV room. He came out with his hand in his chin like that, walking towards me. I looked at him, and then he motioned me to come into the uh, TV room. I went in there, they had a brand new JVC uh, TV, two speakers in the corner, and then uh, a remote control and a let down. Charlie picked the remote control up. I hadn't seen one before because I'd been away a long, my long time myself. And he was looking at the remote control. I said, let it here for you, Charlie. Yeah. He said, um, read it to me, please, Alfie. Read it to me. So, um, I wrote it to him. It said, um, to Charles Bronson, we've got you in the TV. Um, compliments at the POA, Prison Office Association. Then the letter went on and said, um, <laughs> he made me laugh, so yes. Uh, he said, um, please don't, don't let nobody break this one. So as he was pressing, he said, hey, Charlie, I said, it's a JVC. I said, uh, don't let nobody break this one. Any man, Alfie, he said, any man break this one. He said, that's it. But uh, he was a good friend to me. He wasn't a bully or nothing like that. He, uh, a very good. Personally, um, because all the years I was away, over 20 in fact, um, I got extreme paranoia. I'm under a psychiatrist. Um, it didn't do me any good to be locked up like that. And the way Charlie's being locked up is, is, um, is not human. He should, uh, you can't rehabilitate anybody by keeping them locked up. Uh, I'm receiving treatment myself. And uh, what kind of treatment Charlie's going to receive, my professors will tell us that, but they're not supposed to. But uh, he, he deserves a break, I think. He's not a danger to nobody. Not a, he killed nobody, and um, it's just uh, the system had done this to him. His mother said in, in, the, in the Welsh Mirror that he's misunderstood. I did understand, I understood him to a certain extent, but um, it, it's what the system had done to Charlie, you know, and uh, because of the tr trouble and the fighting he's been in, they, they, uh, they try and get back at him, and then they wind him up more. And he ain't, a he ain't a type of man to take anything lying down. And, um, well, I still believe that he's going to win his appeal. And I still believe he'll be home within about six years. Because if he's not, I mean, uh, he, he, he's, he's had to endure this for too long. And uh, he don't have children or women. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm still in his corner. And uh, I, I will go for a walk with him one day out in the country. I know that. And so does Charlie. The only thing that we printed about him is what mad things he does. If he actually gets a chance to get a book out there of his own version of what happened, it might even score up a little bit. And for him, it's a very, very important thing to actually let the world see that he isn't a start raving mad person and, and a danger to society and, you know, you've got to keep your eye on him or he'll be up on your roof pulling the slates off and all that. He's not really that bad and it, it will never ever be said unless he says it himself um, 
what he's really like. And it's his chance to actually go, well, this is me, judge me on that, you know, not on the news of the world, judge me on what I say about me. If at the end of it you are, you're not pleased with me, then I'll live with that. But at least, in my own words, let me tell you what I'm about. And it's very similar to how I feel about my book. Charlie Bronson is no longer an arm robber, um, a, a violent monster that runs around attacking everything that walks, you know, it's, that's really not it. And the press are not allowed to actually say that. So they will just keep pumping out things that he's a start raving loony and give them the opportunity that they need to keep him in there for as long as they want. You know, he's there really as a deterrent, not for the um, crimes that he's committed. He's there as a deterrent for the rest of the world to say, this is what we would do if you turn out like that. Well, I think the answer to Charlie is strike a deal with him and say, we'll let you out in five years or even six years if you can be behavior keeps normal and you make progress your writing so that you can do something useful when you get out. And if he had a five-year date, I think he would handle it. But when he's got no date at all, then he's got nothing to lose. And he'll maybe just continue every now and again. I mean, only has to happen once every five years, and he'll never get out. So that's the only answer. They've done it before. Michael Hubbard let his people out, allegedly because he gave information regarding a drugs ring in Turkey and uh, the cashier weapons for the IRA. A lot of nonsense. Nobody was ever arrested and charged with anything. And the cashier, they made themselves before they were captured. And Michael Howard let them out and they were seven, 18 years. So they can't say it, it can't be done because it can be done. Premier Division bad men all think very, very much of Charlie. Uh, purely because they've actually been locked up with him and seen the staunchness of the man. And no matter what the penalty might be, he will jump up and defend you all the time. You know, we're, we're, even if you're wrong, in Charlie's eyes, you're right because you're a friend. And um, although that might not do his parole chances a lot of good, it does nothing but win him respect from the other people that have lived with him. And when you say you've been to prison with someone, you can truly say you know them. You know them when you're, when you're locked up in a prison, you see uh, a, a cellmate knows the man better than your wife would know you because you see him under 24 hours all year in, all year out. You know how often, what he likes to eat, what he don't like to eat, how often he wanks, whether he farts in bed, whether he snores, what he's like when he's frightened, what he's like when he's anticipating parole, what he's like when he's nervous, what he's like when he's happy. Well, you know, you live in with him 24 hours a day, and they have all lived with Charlie under very close quarters for a very, very long time. And so they would know them better, they would know him better than most other people. And if they all say, he's a good one, then who am I to sort of differ that? So, and all I can, all I can say is, uh, everything that these people have told me about anything else, they've always been right. And for all of them to preach Charlie to me in such a good way, I know that he's a good man. That's what I feel. Yeah, Ronnie Cray mentioned him a couple of times to me. You know, um, uh, his actual words were, that man is one right proper handful, right? <laughs> and uh, you can't do anything better than have someone like that on your side because you would not want him as an enemy. So um, from a man like Ronnie, that would be the biggest accolade you could possibly have, you know? Yeah. You would, you would truly only need five of them in your little firm to um, make an awful lot of difference, you know, in a, in a violent situation. And I'm afraid in the walk of life that I was in, violent situations did arise mm, on a frequent basis where you did have to sort of, you know, dig the old thing up out of the garden and off you go to war. You know, I'm afraid it does happen. As much as people won't like to hear it, I'm afraid it does. And you would need a man that was like, you know, I'm Spikers, to be on your side. Well, I, I first met Charlie Bronson in, um, in Long Larton Prison. I think it was 1989. And I found him a, a good friend. He cleaned with me for months and months and months. And uh, I sorted out a party for him when, when he, uh, 
Well, he lost his temper because I'd been, I'd been drinking too much, and I'd been smoking cannabis. He, he asked them to get a doctor to me, he did, and he'd give them 10 minutes, they didn't, and uh, he lost his temper the next morning. So, um, they put him in solitary for a month. I, um, I organized a party along with uh, Johnny Walker, the Birmingham Six, for Charlie to come back out, and, and we had a party for him. Um, I was with him for a long time after that, and he, he lost his school again, and that's when he went there. At that time, Valium was, was a thing, like, like that sort of trip to that type of stuff. I mean, if, if you can get on that, it's an easy way out. It's another way out of it, but I mean, what, then, then you're dealing with human wrecks, zombies. I've seen men on it. Cool. Give them that, give them a tot of that. Yeah, have a tot of that, keep you calm, you know. And you tend to go down, I, but I had it. I was on the Valium, the Mogadon. We all was. I mean, because, you're living in you're living in in, in, in in a place that can go up at any time, any given time. You know, the sentence is given out now. I mean, you, if you're expecting men to serve 20, 30, and then tell the sentences, I mean, what you're dealing with, you know, and and it seems to be a regular thing now. You can't just lock a grown man in a prison and forget about it for the next 30 years because what are you what are you going to release? What are you doing? Been writing to me for years, and. Um he told me not to get into it, you know, any more trouble. I got a wonderful free life. He upsets me and my family and my girlfriend in letters, and he makes us cry now and again. He, you know, he deserves a break. He's not, he's not the monster that they make him out to be in the papers. He's nowhere near a monster, you know. But. Um, The influence he had on me, he, he, through his letters, you know, stay out there, don't, don't do nothing wrong, and, well, I think a man like that should come out and, and talk to people around schools and not tell them to um, children. He always says in his letters about um, when they see me in the papers and things like that. They said, uh, when Charlie wrote back to me when I was in the papers the last time, he said, that's telling the children uh, good things, he said, and not bad. And, uh, well, he's had a, a good influence on me in respect. He told me not to. And hopefully, you know, we get involved in projects, we can see that that's the, the best way out for him, because the other way, there's no way out for him if he keeps letting his uh, self go out of control. We need to learn greater control over his urges and behave himself. And I think he would do that if he had something definite to look forward to, instead of nothing, which is what he's got at the moment. I mean, he could easily be in prison for 20, 30 years, and what's he done? He's never killed anyone. I don't think he's particularly hurt anyone in any serious way. I don't really know about that, but as far as I understand, he's sort of grabbing people hostages. Okay, it does a mental harm, but, you know, if you were going to court outside without being in prison, you would have an awful hard job convicting you for something like that if there's no damage. I don't see why it should be any different in there. Personally, I, I've had drawings off Charlie for years. Uh, I've kept a lot of them, I've put them in frames. Uh, it's been amazing. And I think they, they keep his head straight and he is a good cartoonist, a, a good drawer, like. But, um, um, well, his drawings, they, they keep him calm. He sent me his last Cosler award he did his fifth one. Not bad, he said, for a madman. <laughs> and he, still, he can still make me laugh in his letters. But, uh, 
Yes, his drawings, they're just really they're brilliant. But the effect they've had on him, I, I think they, they've calmed him down. When, when, it, when he couldn't have a pencil or anything, um, my girlfriend Bev sent him a, 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 roller, a roller pencil. And uh, he received that just after he came off that anger strike he did. And uh, he was happy with that. I, I, I sent him drawing paper and things to to help him because he's got nothing and uh, without a shadow of a doubt Charlie's been uh, abused by the system. They, they've um, they tied his insides up and uh, now they should untie him if they can. But I mean uh, that don't mean keeping a man where, where he is for any much lot for a lot lo lo longer because um, Uh, well, they go and do what they've done. Rehabilitation don't mean keep the man locked up in a cage like, like you have done for all these years. And it's only going to make him worse. Uh, they're not going to kill him. Uh, but they have abused him and it's, it's time they undone it, as far as I'm concerned. And... Uh, uh, I haven't gone through what Charlie's gone through, no, nowhere near it. But personally, I get panic attacks around people or groups of people. I get serious paranoia. Uh, what Charlie is going to get, I don't know. But it don't mean keeping him there much longer because you wouldn't treat the animal the way they, they, they treated him. Eh? Um, I, think, I think he's got to have some kind of rehabilitation. He, he's he's getting on in years now. He, he don't. Uh, I don't think he deserves much more than a life sentence. Is there, there's more worse people on every housing estate in Britain than Charles Bronson. Uh, we're talking rapists, paedophiles, uh, drug dealers, drug mugs. You can call them what you want. Charlie's none of those. Uh, he's always had. The utmost respect for women and children, and um, I think he deserves a break. I, I was never intimidated in the prison, you know, and, and the whole time I was in the prison, which was no, nothing like as long as, as Charlie Bronson was doing, I was in prison for nearly 13 years. Um, I, had, I was involved in, in two fights, if you like, you know, and um, I, just, I just got on with people and I, always, I had realised that I had a date, remember, different for Charlie Bronson. I had a date to go and I had a date to aim for. So I decided, right, I'll have to exist in the prison. And the best way to do that is to become involved in the prison. So when I was able to, I went on the educational courses. I'd done my work every day. I was in a tailor shop in Peterhead for years. And then I went to the educational classes and when I graduate, you learn to live in prison. You go to think about what's happening in the prison next month, not what you should be doing outside. That's what makes it hard. So you ignore outside, concentrating inside. I took, I took about one visit a year from my mother because she wanted to come and visit me. I never got visits, maybe an odd visit, very occasionally from someone else, but mainly visits disrupt you because you start thinking about outside and comparing it. You've got to learn to live in the prison, and that's what you call doing time. It's, it's pretty obvious that they're, they're all kind of fighting from them. And uh, I bet before they go on duty, they're all saying, oh, I wonder if we're going to get the day. We better pest this man. We'll keep him locked up as long as possible. Um, I don't know. It's, it's the, the only way they can handle it with Charlie, is to let him see that there's some light at the end of his tunnel and, and uh, let him mix more. As far as I understand, he's only allowed to mix with one or two other prisoners at a time, if ever. And he's locked up in a cell with cardboard furniture. That's so destroying and he might even go worse. But unless he gets a deal, and they've done it before, this is the whole point. Look at Jimmy Boyle. I mean, he gets 15 years. 
he must have committed offences in prison that got added on at least, at least another 15 years on his life sentence. They never done a day, because they'd done a deal, but not with him so much as with themselves, and they had to prove that this so-called psychiatric unit in Berlin was a success because everybody in the penal business around the world was watching it. He got out exactly on his recommended date, and he's one of the very few people that's ever happened to, because he was a pest and a nuisance. And when they put him in the unit, they had to show the public that the unit worked, and he got out. They should do something similar with Bronson. They've made his, his time harder, whereas the people that went in the unit in Scotland were the worst behaved, and ended up with the best condition. You had people like myself who had just got on with their sentence, never bothered anybody, worked hard, get nothing at the end of the day. So the answer seemed to be then, cause more trouble and you'll get sent to the unit and you get visits all day, every day. You know, guys have gone to that unit and ended up alcoholic. Well, when you're locked up and you're, I was in security for years, you don't, you don't get out as often as the rest of the prisoners and you just, you know, they to paint as well. It's just something you, you do as a defence mechanism. When Zuma magazine started up as a, um, like a four sheet photocopy spread for local students, um, a bit of advertising, a bit of help and a bit of pushing, it's grown into what it is today. You know, 30, 28, 32 pages, full colour, glossy, free distribution across the South Coast. We had letters to the editor. One month, a cartoon came in um, from this Charles Bronson. Totally mad. I, at the time, I didn't know who it was. I printed it, and then people started coming up and thinking, that's Charlie Bronson. Can I see the original? Someone offered me 200 quid for it. I'm like, well, hold on. No, no. Um, so having him on our side helping is brilliant. You know, it's absolutely brilliant. And we, get, we get, do get calls from PR companies and you know, media houses all over the country asking if, who it, is it the real Charles Bronson. You know. So they do chase it up, and yeah, we've got a lot of interest now. This is his page. He does what he wants. We're not, uh, you know, highlighting it. Well, obviously we are, but we're not saying, oh, this this guy's great. You know, go and rob a go and rob a bank. It's just yeah. letting him do what he wants. You know, he wants to tell people about what he's doing. The press, the press aren't covering his stuff all the time. We will. I think it's ridiculous the way they're treating him. Um, and keeping him in a cell like that with no window, he's got hardly any air coming in. I mean, you wouldn't do that to an animal, so why do it to a human being? I mean, it's, it's just terrible, you know. Um, the way I see it is they do that to Charlie, to rile him, to get him all worked up, um, thinking that he'll go off on one again. And then they can put it down to Charlie Bronson, the dangerous, uh, dangerous man and violent man, like what they do. When, at the end of the day, it's them that's making him do it. Well, it's definitely not fair what they're doing to him, um, because uh, it's the way they're treating him that's uh, making him. You know, they, as I said before, they just try to wind him up. Um, and at the moment, he's just been knocked back from going on to B-Wing, which I think is out of order, because I think if he got on B-Wing, he would be a lot happier, and it would be a lot easier all round. Because he's, he's not like they say, you know, it's, I mean, these stories in the newspapers and everything. Uh, that were back in Christmas 92, uh, when Charlie were out and we met up and he was living in a caravan at the Isle of Sheppey and uh, I moved in with him. Um, but uh, his mind was more on Bertha, his medicine bowl. And he even went to the lens of taking my favourite leather skirt and his favourite um, because he always said he liked that one. And he actually took the leather skirt and made it into a coat for Bertha to keep her warm. Central News at six with Ann Dawson and Wesley Smith. Good evening, welcome to the program. Our main stories tonight, cartoons by a killer. Britain's most dangerous prisoner gets his own exhibition. Central TV has to accept responsibility for putting out such misleading news items 
As a direct consequence of this item, it resulted in a London newspaper printing this story. The newspaper's editor at once apologised and printed a retraction. Unlike Central TV, which is run by Carlton, they could only manage a letter without an apology and no retraction. Michael Winner, a national newspaper columnist, also boobed when he mentioned Charlie was a killer. He printed a, re a retraction the following week. This sort of media assassination has undoubtedly added to the misleading notion the public have of Charlie. Another item written by Robin Ackroyd after Charlie was given a life sentence for the Phil Danielson hostage inc incident at Hull Prison appeared in a national newspaper and totally lied about Charlie saying he had nothing to lose by killing someone now that he'd been given a life sentence. Ackroyd admitted to Charlie's solicitor, Mr. T, that he did it for sensationalism. Charlie is now suffering the consequences of these misleading items and is still in solitary confinement. The authorities cannot take a chance that there might have been some truth in these blatant lies. The media often ignores the good that Charlie does, though unless it is sensational news, they don't wish to cover it. Charlie's charity work often goes unnoticed. His official website, bronsonmania.com, was launched so as to act as a source of truthful information about Charlie. A fan club was set up in order to promote his plight, as well as the Bronson line which gives regular updates on his circumstances. There's also a monsters section, which allows browsers to choose which paedophile or which monster they'd like to hang. Pauline New was Charlie's first pin-up cellmate of the month on his website. The good work others do is also featured Charlie doesn't like to leave anyone out, and he can, in his own way, promote other people. As well as linked to other sites associated with him. It also features his artwork. Books and video reviews also feature. Charles Watson from the northeast of England has had a tattoo designed by Charlie Bronson. This tattoo he has had placed onto his thigh, and that's in celebration of Charlie Bronson after reading Silent Scream. Um purely because the name Charlie Robson preceded the person I was about to meet. Um, he was renowned through the prison service as being a, a, a very difficult, violent, um, unpredictable character. Um, so, so to that end, my first meeting of Charlie was, was a great deal of nerves um, as a young sort of prison officer in, in the line of duty. Um, this, this was in Belmarsh, about 1993, I believe, um, when I first, first actually came across Charlie. Yes, it was uh, typical of Charlie, um, where he, we, we stopped at some traffic lights, and uh, Charlie was naked, as, as he always prefers to travel, with this um, sort of rather Victorian restraint-type body belt around his waist. And... Uh, we pulled up these traffic lights and, and next to us was this coach of um, old ladies going on a, a day trip to Margate or wherever. And Charlie, of the nature of Charlie, he loves the old, uh, he, he seems to love old old ladies, old men that have been through the war. They, To him, I think they symbolize Britain as a country and, and uh, the struggle against the, the, the old sort of 
war days and the war times. And uh, Charlie stood up to, to wish them all well, you know, through this through the glass of this this coach. And uh, I sort of said to Charlie, look, you know, I'd be a bit careful, Charlie, because you haven't got any clothes on, you know, and these are old ladies, you know. And uh, Charlie said, no, nah. he said, I've been in thousands of these buses before with this. There's no problem, you know, it's, they can't see through the glass. And I, I could see these old ladies sort of looking out of the corner of their eye. And it wasn't until we got to Bristol that it, it was, in fact, a new bus that we were in, which, for one reason or another, didn't have sufficient tinted windows. And you could actually see straight through these glass these glass windows on the bus. So, obviously, they got a, a good eye for the Charlie wishing them well. But he, he asked me to get the radio out and tune in to whatever local channel we could get on this old transistor radio. Um, and I was struggling to try and try and get some sort of um, tune out of the radio. And Charlie, Charlie advised me to pull the aerial out to see if we could get a better reception. So I sort of gingerly pulled it out halfway and it, and it's, it stuck. And he said, no, no, he said, it comes out, it, you know, it'll extend fully out. So I, I give it a good yank. And at that, the whole aerial just came out of the radio. And, and I was left with the radio in this hand and the aerial in this hand. And Charlie's face, for that split second just sort of looked a picture because I'd broken this radio that he'd had for sort of 20 odd years and, and it had followed him through all sorts of prison moves and um, I, I I sort of thought oh here we go you know Charlie's going to pull my head off at the same time the same way that I've pulled the uh, the aerial out of the radio but we, we just again just laughed about it and pushed it back in and and, and that was that. After, after this, this trip, I was actually nicknamed by Charlie, and, and it still carries on now, although I'm now the ex-hardball screw um, because I'm no longer with the prison service. Um, Charlie, as, as anybody that knows him, um, will agree that he, he loves his food, um, and all he could s s salvage from, from the kitchens on the way for this trip to Bristol was, that, was a, a sack full of sort of 20 hard-boiled eggs uh, and halfway down the motorway, Charlie got a bit hungry, and, he, and because of the, the nature of the restraint, he he wanted me to uh, take the shells off these hard-boiled eggs and, and sort of hand feed him. And I no sooner sort of un, unwrapped one one egg and put it in his mouth gingerly, to, so he could chew it, give him time to chew it and, and digest it. That he, he wanted another egg and another egg, and it ended up with about he had he must have had about five or six hard-boiled eggs in his mouth, crammed in his mouth, and uh, he, he ended up having to cough half of them out all over the floor of the bus because it, it had been, uh, he couldn't swallow the amount that I'd actually shoveled in his mouth. Um, and he made some sort of comment about the fact that uh, I, I was trying to, I, I almost succeeded in killing him off like the, the prison service had tried to do for years or something. Um, just by shoving these hard-boiled eggs into his mouth and, and half choking him down the motorway. And that, that name has just stuck stuck ever since. So every correspondence I get now with Charlie is, is always something in there to relate to the ex-hardboard screw. I think a lot of the prison service uh, mentality is that it is a very much them enough situation where the, the prison officer is, is, has it ingrained into him that you are the officer, they are the prisoner and they're, they're below you, if you like. Um, I actually found that I had more in common with 90% of the prisoners that I was dealing with than I did with probably 100% of the staff that I was working with um, in, in the way that I could, I could sit and chat and have a cup of tea with some of the guys that were actually doing time. Um, and I found it very difficult to be on the same sort of level as, uh, as as I was there in, in the tea room with the lads at, at lunch. When Charlie falls down to the ground, if he rolls, Lost and unfound The prison is waiting And he knows it's true 
she can put a man on a desperate avenue when he is alone. It's fair he hides, but she wants it all. She'll even take your pride, and she's always waiting. Yeah, she's there for you. She'll put you out on that desperate avenue. Hey, I can't deny that she's there. I think that um, our work with Charlie at Belmarsh at the time was um, helped Charlie immensely. I mean, initially we 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 began to um, introduce him to things that, that he'd never had before, such as playing playing a game of badminton with him or playing Scrabble with him, um, and 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 we actually treated him like he was another human being rather than this monstrous madman that, that we should shouldn't even speak to other than the times when we've given him food through the door and we, we actually got involved with him we actually made him feel that we 
felt safe with him and, and that he could trust us. We, you know, we had to build up that, that trust on both sides. Um, from the management level, I think there is a lot of intimidation from the higher levels down to the, to the lower grades. I have heard staff sitting there bragging that they've, they've dealt with Charlie and they've dealt with this man and that man um, purely, purely to make themselves look to perhaps younger members of staff or that they are actually uh, slightly, slightly more experienced and slightly more bigger than they are, if you like. It's since I've left. I mean, it's 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 been a big. Well, I think uh, my first perception of Charlie was was that he was very much a human being, and he, he he's he's just been. Uh, forced down, down the sort of the road that he's took. Um, I would like to see that he, he actually is given the chance to settle somewhere, um, to prove himself to other people as I know he's proved himself to me. Um, and I would like to see the prison authorities actually realise that this guy is not the, the dangerous animal that they try and portray him as. But he is, he is actually a very talented, very sincere man. Um, and I, I think he needs to be settled down in a proper rehabilitation sort of process, which he's offered to other prisoners with, when, he's, when he's with myself and other people that he trusts and respects. He is a great guy. There's no, uh, there's no sort of... Uh, viciousness or, or, or maliceness within him. I think he he has been mishandled in the past, which to my in my view Charlie has, has reacted to that better than, than I would be able to react to it. Um, if I had undergone some of the treatment that, that Charlie underwent 15, 20 years ago, I would certainly not be the man that Charlie is today. I, I think I would be uh, twisted and, and totally against anything. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be able to be, be in a position to strike up a friendship with uh, somebody like myself in, in, a, in a prison uniform in, in authority. Um, so I think he, he was mishandled a number of years ago. And I think these nowadays, they are still treating Charlie with, with a great deal of intrepidation really. Um, to me there's nothing mad about Charlie at all. I mean Charlie as I said before had the strength of character to actually befriend somebody like me who should have been the last person on the earth that he would he would even contemplate talking to um, and to me that that is by no means a sign of a madman. Um, you've only got to look at the what Charlie's achieved in, in the most difficult of circumstances with his, his artistry and his, his, his books, um, his poems and, and, and his, his goals, if you like. He, I mean, he's looking at uh, opening the restaurants, he's opening, he's looking at more books, more, more drawings, more pictures. Um, somebody who perhaps hasn't got a hope of ever seeing that, so, that from the outside. Um, it's just amazing to me, for me, to actually sit here and think that he's actually uh, achieving all those things. I mean, I, I wouldn't dream of achieving half of what he's achieved in my lifetime. Um, and, and I've never been in, in, in the sort of situation that he's been in, um, which, which is against all the odds. He's, he's beaten everybody that, that has ever tried to put him down. and. Uh, made a success out of his out of his life. No, I don't think he uh, he, he likes it or I don't think he's thriving on it, that's my opinion. I think he just left alone, he'll do his bird like any other prisoner. But he's like gone along a street and as he's going down that street, it's a street which you go deeper and deeper and deeper. 
and it's a, a street full of problems. And you can't, you, can't, you can't see the way out of that street. It just gets deeper and darker and worse. And that's what Charles happened to Charlie. He can't get out of that rut. He just wouldn't be pushed about by the screws. But he didn't look for no trouble. But if they wanted to give it to me, we'd give it back. And that's Charlie, and that, they don't like that at all. That's just vindictiveness on the police's part to take away all his paintings, uh, anything he wants to do in the artistic world. I mean, he's won, he won about four or five Kessler Awards for yeah. his painting. So, I mean, isn't it petty and vindictive to take that away from him? Yeah. They've got him in a, in, in a cell now with no windows. Uh, I think they're feeding him through the door. You know what I mean? So, I mean, what do you expect a man? He just... Screws have created a monster in Charlie Bronson. They've created it. They now they don't know what to do with it. You know, now they've got him and they don't know what they're doing. They created this monster. I mean, things like he said, like in a joke, you know, I could eat any racky for breakfast. Well, we know that's so silly. But they bit onto that. Newspapers, screws, suddenly they make him like an Hannibal Lecter. And they've got a monster on their hands now. But he's not a monster. They've created it. They don't want Charlie Bronson out. He's got about six years to do. If he uh, gets this not guilty on this so so called hostage taking with this guy, you know, um, it's, they don't want him out. They either want to kill him in there, or they just want to keep him in there for life. That's what they're aim that's what they aim to do. I mean, he's never he's not. I'm being on the wings with Charlie. He's no danger to another con. He's no danger to the screws, really, if the screws leave him alone. Give him his painting, let him get on with it like everybody else does. But as they've got this monster on them now, they just create worse and worse and worse. They keep pushing him and pushing him and pushing the guy until he breaks. Then when he snaps, he does something wrong. And uh, he, he's not being treated the way he should be treated like another con. And, and they make the guy do what he does. They push him into it. You know what I mean? He's never done no harm to no one else outside. I'd be quite willing to have Charlie stay with me. Yeah. So you're with my family. You're that easy. Because I know that he's no danger to anybody. And my family could be around. I don't look at him as a danger to, to kids. He's not a murderer. He's not a rapist. He's just fighting against the establishment. He's kind of handling people, pushing them around. I mean, a screw would push a con around and he would say, yes sir, no sir, free barry for you. Push Charlie, Charlie turned a piss off out of it. That's the strength of it. He's no danger on the wings and mentally. If he was, if he was mentally insane, he'd be in Broadmoor. Broadmoor said he's not insane. That's where Charlie's got one up on the likes of me and you. Because he's been proved sane, we haven't. When they let him out of Broadmoor. So he has been proved sane. So there's nothing wrong with Charlie. I'd be quite willing to have Charlie stay with me. Yeah. So you're with my family. You're that easy. Because I know that he's no danger to anybody. And my family could be around. I don't look at him as a danger to, to kids. He's not a murderer. He's not a rapist. He's just fighting against the establishment. He's kind of handling people, pushing them around. Yeah. I mean... A screw would push a con around and he would say, yes sir, no sir, free barry for you. Push Charlie, Charlie turned a piss off out of it. That's the strength of it. Prior to the making of this documentary, I asked Her Majesty's Prison Service permission to visit Charlie and film an interview. This was declined on the grounds that it would be unfair to his victims. Some weeks later, a televised counselling session with serial killer Dennis Nilsson was screened on UK television. The filming was done with the blessing of the prison service. I then asked the prison service headquarters to make comment on Charlie's position via a spokesman. The prison service didn't even acknowledge my three recorded delivery letters. 
Insiders from the prison service who wished to remain anonymous indicated that in an internal meeting of prison service hierarchy, they decided that Charlie would be kept in isolation for two years from the time he took Phil Danielson hostage in February 1999. This seems to be true since Charlie has fulfilled all the criteria as laid down by the Home Office Prison Directorate, yet he has not progressed through the prison system. Charlie's lawyer, Tahir Khan, was recently refused permission by Governor Yeomans of Woodhill Prison to visit seven inmates that Mr. Khan proposes to call as witnesses in Charlie's appeal against his life sentence. Governor Yeomans doesn't seem to be au fait with the law, and it would seem he's not aware of the criminal laws relating to perverting the course of justice in his advising Mr. Khan that he has to be sent a visiting order from each of the seven category A prisoners if he wishes to see them. In such strict category A conditions, this visiting procedure can take up to three months to process. Another order, authorized by Governor Yeomans, nearly resulted in a serious situation at Woodhill Prison when Charlie's lawyer, T, was told he couldn't take any money into the visits room in order to buy Charlie a few chocolate bars from a vending machine. An insider from Wood Hill leaked out the story that T and Charlie sat in a small visits room, refusing to move until a senior member of the prison service intervened. And without the quick thinking of Governor Keeler, there would have been a very serious incident in which the Mufti squad might have ended up taking the room by force. Governor Keeler went to the vending machine and out of his own money bought Charlie a drink and some chocolate bars. And Governor Yeomans, it would seem, is causing some friction within the prison. Latest reports suggest an application for a judicial review is being considered by Charlie's legal team. Since Charlie has been given his life sentence, he hasn't been seen by a prison psychologist, which is always the case in such circumstances. Charlie would now refuse to have such assessments since he argues it would only be carried out to satisfy the statutory requirements that this documentary raises. The promise made by Governor Yeomans of Woodhill Prison to Mr. Khan that a room for Charlie to do his artworking would be a step in the right direction has failed to materialize. Charlie now spends 23 hours and 50 minutes of every day in prison squalor. He has now refused to take up the option of one hour a day for the yard exercise, which he is allowed by law. As he says, his times were always being changed, therefore he didn't take that option. Then the prison service couldn't take it away from him. I personally have written countless letters to the prison media service to secure an official media visit to Charlie under the House of Lords rulings that allows this to happen. Charlie is entitled to a media visit regarding the miscarriage of justice applied in his case. Their delaying tactics have now gone on for some five months. And Mr. Khan has pursued the matter on Charlie's behalf and he too has been met with a wall of silence. This too is a breach of Charlie's basic human rights. The prison media service claimed that letters Charlie has written to them have gone missing. The last photograph Charlie had taken with his mother was some 18 years ago. An application made to the prison director by Charlie to have a photo taken with his mother, Ira, was being turned down, even though the photo was for personal use. Woodhill Prison Governor Yeomans and the prison service have failed in their duty to help rehabilitate Charlie. Charlie has even been advised that he wouldn't even be considered for parole and that he'd be released straight from his category A status whenever that was to be or that any home leave wouldn't ever ever be allowed so as to help him acclimatize to civilian life. Charles Bronson is now fulfilling all requirements to progress through the prison system and he always remains sincerely yours.
was saying. Used to be. Laughing all the way to the crematorium. All this talk again. But now, I've changed my philosophy of life. Because I'm doing life for the time being. And now I say, laughing all the way to the apple pie factory. And I know in my own heart that one day I'm going to walk into the apple pie factory and pick up as many apple pies as humanly possible. It's going to be a long, long time before I visit the crematorium. I'm going to win my appeal. There's no ifs and buts about it. And I'm going to be on the street in five years' time. And I don't want anybody, man, woman or child, or beast, to ever fear me. Because I'm changing my life. And when I've got apple pies, everyone around me's got apple pies. And I'll say to all these young people, don't take drugs. Because the greatest drug in this world is already in your body. And that's adrenaline. And you're born with it. There's nothing better. Nothing more powerful than adrenaline. It's fantastic. Have a great life. Enjoy yourself. And if you've got a mum, give her a cuddle. God bless you all. Sincerely yours, your old China, Charlie Bronson.